yourselves. I'm going to try and start the ceremonies in Welsh. Can you make a dathlith hafun diolk a busgor gwith Daniel Owen? And the aquacod a vivio a sit a be guest TNI Daniel am a freeth a rawain a vod an a awdia. Hafun hefyd diolk a siri rithion gogledd Cymru a ren wedig nyad series ridion a withgrig. Am gynnig y thli harres thiddiol yma a gyfa ar wilt. Gydyfy drefn ac a dyrid nadiau sy'n dithiau yn ôl i amser Daniel fel y sgrifennydd ys y esteffod a withgrig yn mil wth dai seg dai tri. Gan fethlu dan llinethlu Cefogaeth his severiaeth log, sy rydiaeth rid a waith Daniel Owen ac ar y Sethford. Now I'll say it in English. <laughs> That's the hardest part of the lecture, though. <laughs> so before I start this lecture, I'd like to thank the Daniel Owen Festival Committee for inviting me to reflect on how this crisis of faith pushed Daniel into becoming a serious writer. And I'd also like to thank the Freemasons of North Wales in general 
and the Mole Masonic Hall Committee in particular for offering the use of this historic venue, whose furnishings date back to the time of Daniel's role of secretary of the 1873 Mole Estethod, so underlining the long-standing support of Freemasonry for the work of Daniel Owen and the Estethod. This evening, I'm going to give you a lecture about Daniel Owen. The title of the lecture is From Failed Preacher to Promising Novelist. And I've subtitled it, The First 42 Years of Daniel Owen's Quest for Religious Acceptance. I first learned of Daniel Owen at my grandmother's knee. Nine told me of how she met him when she was a little girl and he was an old man. But he'd been a friend of my great-grandmother for even longer. Nine taught me nursery rhymes in Welsh, which is why my spoken Welsh is about the level of a five-year-old child. As that child, I spent my summers in the Mould and Buckley area with Nine's extended family. My great-uncle Teddy inherited the tenancy of, old, of Hen Nine's old house at 36 pounds row, and I would visit him with my great-aunt Annie on market day when she went shopping for him. The house where Daniel was born, Long Ray, Row Massa Ray, was demolished in 1941. Auntie Annie, who had also known him, would point out the site as we walked past it. It was opposite Caer Finon, the small mansion Daniel built with the proceeds of his later successful writing. Auntie Annie would point out the Standing Stone Memorial that was erected in uh, 1951 on the site of the old house. I was four when that was set up. And she'd tell me that was where old Daniel was born. As a child, I was nurtured on the myth that Daniel was forced to give up his preaching to support his poverty-stricken mother and sister, and that he destroyed his health after a serious accident while spending too much time travelling and preaching because of his thwarted desire to become a preacher. Then, when Nine died, I inherited her old copy of Rhys Lewis, the novel which made Daniel Owen famous. For many years I wanted to read it, but I couldn't. i have been taught the basics of Welsh grammar and the fundamentals of the language by a young Welsh teacher in a Manchester school and later at university I learned the basics of translation to be able to read Russian technical papers for my degree. When I retired, I decided to translate Daniel's works so I could read them for myself. Translation for me involves a slow technical process, which I learned for Russian and now apply to Welsh. I found it an extremely satisfying experience and have since translated a lot of Daniel's lesser known works and in the process have discovered a lot of information about his life and activities. I soon found that the reality of Daniel's life was more interesting and complex than the simple myths I heard as a child. This evening, I want to consider three questions. Firstly, why did Daniel feel he should leave tailoring and study to become a preacher? Secondly, what eventually drove him to abandon his college course at Bala and return to the tailoring workshop in Mould without discussing that decision with any of his tutors at the college? And finally, how did he come to discover he had a talent for writing which people engaged with and enjoyed? So let's start with why did Daniel feel he should leave tailoring and study to become a preacher? Well, this is a puzzle. As Daniel admitted, it was a difficult decision to take and was taken despite having a thousand disadvantages. This is what he wrote to his editor, Isaac Phelps. In 1864, I was persuaded by Mr. Ellis Edwards, the son of the Reverend Roger Edwards, to start preaching. At first, I was unwilling to undertake such a task, but Mr. Edwards was a great motivator of men. He was already a scholar, and he knew that I enjoyed the company and conversation of scholars. In 1865, I went to Bala under a thousand disadvantages with the intention of completing a five-year course. But he didn't complete it. It's clear that Daniel did not just drift into preaching, 
because it was a fun thing to do, he was drawn by his environment to take up the cause. And I suspect this was largely down to what happened during his formative years. As a condition of his apprenticeship to Chapel Elder Angel Jones the Taylor, he was forced to attend Bethesda Chapel, Sunday school and weekday prayer meetings. But he didn't join the Seat, that's a sort of chapel council for the elect, until Angel died late in 1859. The case of Nathaniel Jones, who was Daniel's first commissioning editor for Ten Nights in the Black Lion, is useful in helping us to understand the religious pressure that Daniel was under as a young man. Nathaniel got caught up in a spiritual revival started by the Reverend David Morgan, and this was known as the Great Methodist Revival of 1859. A year earlier, Morgan had experienced a personal revelation of God whilst listening to the preacher Humphrey Jones. Humphrey had previously experienced a visitation from the Holy Spirit when he was caught out in a storm on a high mountain path. Together, these two men created a great swell of interest in one of the basic teachings of the Calvinistic Methodists, that a preordained elect would be contacted by the experience of an audience with the living presence of God, provided they concentrated hard enough to intensely focus prayer. The purpose of the seer was to help those aware members of the elect cope with the knowledge of, the heaven, of their heavenly destiny and fulfill their divine purposes. And a secondary purpose was to help these lesser chapel members known as listeners to whom God had not yet called to discover how to bring about the happy event. As a result of the influence of David Morgan, many nominal Calvinists experienced instantaneous conversions whilst attending his charismatic prayer meetings. Morgan specialised in the conversion of listeners. They would come to chapel every Sunday evening, but they weren't members or believers. His meetings attracted regular attenders, moral people interested in Christianity, but not convinced believers. He achieved many remarkable and dramatic conversions of notorious drunkards, blatant wife beaters, and people noted for their immorality and ungodliness. And as a direct result, Calvinism was invigorated and became very popular. Nathaniel experienced just such a personal revelation at one of Morgan's prayer meetings held in Hollywell in June 1859. He promptly gave up his editor's job and enrolled at Ballard College to train as a preacher, leaving Daniel in the lurch with a major translation to complete under a less supportive editor. Nathaniel was ordained in 1864 and took up the post of a minister for the church on the Gower Peninsula. And I'll return to his comments on Daniel's preaching later in this talk. Soon after Daniel had joined Bethesda Seat as a listener, David Morgan's travelling conversion circus rolled into mould. This is how the meeting was described by the Welsh Herald. A mighty association was held in mould in March 1860, when Morgan and Lewis Edwards from Bala College preached. Also present were Edward Matthews, a preacher from Bridgend and a contributor to a Dressova. Henry Rees, a popular preacher and a past moderator of the Calvinistic Methodists in Wales was there also, as was Stephen Lewis, Owen Thomas, John Phillips, Griffin Hughes, Rhys Jones and J.R. Hughes of Holyhead. The Friend magazine reported that the crowds were enveloped in tears and a roar of praise arose. They cried with great joy when Edward Matthews cried out the verse, he also raised me from the thick soil and the clay and laid my blood upon the rock. The Herald later recorded that in the first months of 1860, the number of new members to the Mole churches was over 250. And at the census of 1861, the population was recorded as 3,735. So this meant that one in 15 of the population suddenly became members of the elect. Daniel, however, was not among them. There are two important things to notice about this meeting. 
Firstly, it was not held in Capel Moa, Bethesda, which was the largest Calvinist chapel in the town and could have accommodated the audience, but at the assembly room just over the street from Daniel's workplace. Secondly, the Reverend Roger Edwards, Minister of Bethesda, did not take part. As it took place so close to the workshop of the tailors known locally as the Parliament of Mould, I strongly suspect that some of them, including Daniel, attended the event. Of that group, only Nathaniel was persuaded by the emotional pressure Morgan placed on people to make a public declaration of revelation. Morgan seems to have accepted such a declaration meant that they had been born again and was a sign of a successful visitation. Dozens of people would remain behind after the meetings and it was impossible for one man to speak to them all personally in full view of the congregation and give adequate counsel to them all. In my view, the Reverend Roger Edwards was worried that Morgan's spiritual counselling didn't include any detailed examination of the person's faith in Christ. Morgan took it for granted and assumed that by staying behind, they had made a declaration of faith. Many Calvinists of the time thought that Morgan encouraged a dumbing down of the vision of the elect, so it became a human decision rather than the work of the Spirit, and that he encouraged a delusion among individuals who came to the front to assume that they were indeed members of the elect rather than just listeners. This dilemma can be seen running through Daniel's sermons, and I think contributed to his decision to give up preaching. However, it was many years before he came to that decision, and he continued to ascend the seat as a listener. That was where Alice Edwards, Roger Edwards' son, persuaded him to try his hand at preaching, to see if that would lead him to a personal revelation. So what sort of preacher was Daniel? Isaac Folks, his editor, said this of his old friend. When preaching, Daniel Owen would begin in a low yet audible voice, which showed no intonation and expressed no sense of joy. He would not ever shout, which is not surprising as he never felt any desire to shout. He spoke rapidly and at length in the same monotonal voice he used in the house, in the shop and on the highway. He considered he did not need to raise his voice to make his case. He was so quiet as to seem insensitive, as if he feared the truths he wanted to speak of and was afraid of them coming between him and his congregation. But I would like to suggest a different reason for this quiet delivery, and I base it on where he learned to preach. Daniel didn't learn public speaking in a chapel, but in intimate prayer meetings held in the front room of my great-grandmother's family home the house of John Griffiths, my great-great-grandfather in Pownell's Row, Mould. Caroline Blackwell, knee Griffiths, had been born while Daddy Griffiths was still living next door to Daniel's mother Sarah in Long Row, Mysa Dre. John Griffiths remained a good friend to Sarah and her family all his life, even though he moved to Pownell's Row and later to the Keeper's Cottage on the Bailey Hill. After Nine Caroline was widowed, she ran a small shop in the front room of her house in 35 Pounds Row, where she also held prayer meetings, as her father had before her. Not only could you go along to pray and sing, you could also buy any groceries you might need. What's not to like? The Griffiths family home in Pounds Row proved to be an ideal meeting place for Daniel to practice preaching. He refers to just such a meeting in his novel, Rhys Lewis, and his description reminds me of Nine Blackwell's house. I often wonder if this was where Daniel developed his convention of speaking in a quiet monotone. He could have easily fallen into this odd habit as he first began to practice as a public speaker in the small front room of a house in Pownell's Row. I visited that room as a child and I can assure you that Daniel would never have needed to raise his voice to be heard in every corner of it. For the Reverend John Owen, who became Daniel's minister in his later years, spoke to members of Bethesda congregation who had been present at Daniel's first venture into preaching 
and this is what he discovered. It was in a house in Powell's Roll, Massadre, that he preached his first sermon, and that on a working night. It was only a small room and the congregation filled the place, which was rather overpowering for him, such was his lack of self-possession. However, he reached into his pocket to bring out what he had previously prepared in writing and read it out. This is a description I received of the sermon from one who listened to it. It was a thoughtful sermon, composed in detail and with delicious and beautiful language. It had edges and hooks in it and followed a practical direction with all its comments. Its narrative was charming and natural, and this first sermon set up a tradition for his characteristic features in subsequent years when he preached in chapels. His mode of delivery was such that he did not sing out or raise his voice, although he didn't depreciate those who did this effectively. His sermons were like his later literary style, extremely simple and to the point. He didn't beat around the bush, and what he said was clear. It felt as if he had understood what his congregation needed to hear. He didn't talk about the truth, instead he spoke truth to his listeners. You might say he was a popular preacher, yet in general he spoke quietly to his congregation. He was a very real preacher, one sister from this town told me. He was inclined to incorporate doctrinal subjects into his preaching, which he didn't bother to explain. Yet from the smallest reference he had a complete picture of them and shared his own imagination of the history of every biblical occasion. He could easily be carried away by his imagination. His face and tone of voice were intense and severe, and he didn't show the humour that characterised his later writings. The sermons that he later published during his illness show his special features as a preacher. His method was less common at that time than it is now, especially among the Calvinistic Methodists. Not everyone enjoyed the clear and penetrating elements of Daniel Owen's insights. But when they were published in a Dresorba, they provoked highly complimentary attention and acceptance. Daniel confirmed that he was drawn to begin preaching by the influence of his friends. John Owen recorded this conversation. Daniel had proved himself to be a man of extensive ability in the debating societies and in town meetings, but he was not initially drawn to preaching. He claimed that he only took it up when he was urged by his friends to begin preaching. He had already shown a strong ability to think through the writing down of an idea, and perhaps his friends, seeing his special qualities, encouraged him to take part in the work of the ministry. He said that without their pushing, he would never have taken this step. From what he wrote himself, I believe he was never convinced that he'd been called to preaching. On this rather shaky basis of being good at debate, Daniel was encouraged to apply for a scholarship at Bala College, and he passed the entrance exam. Just over a year after he had given his first sermon, he was accepted on a five-year course at Bala College leading to ordination. So what eventually it drove him to abandon his college course at Bala and return to the tailoring workshop in Mould? without discussing his decision with any of his tutors at the college. Well, Daniel had received little formal education. When he was young, there was only one free school in Mould, the National School, held at Ponterwild on Chester Street. The National Schools provided free elementary education to the children of the poor that was based on the practices of the Church of England for the children had to attend the morning service at St Mary's Church every Sunday. And if they did not get a mark in the church register, they would be caned on Monday morning. If they consistently failed to attend church, they would be expelled from the school. The schoolmaster was Mr John Roberts, and its sponsor, the Vicar of Mould. The National School taught in English, while all the poor children of Mould spoke Welsh. Mr Roberts had been employed as their teacher specifically because he didn't speak Welsh. The National School Movement in Wales believed that children would learn more English if their teacher spoke no Welsh. J 
just as they believed that forcing the children to attend Anglican services would benefit the National Church. Daniel was obliged by his mother to attend the Sunday school held in the, Beth in the Bethesda Methodist Chapel on Sunday afternoons, which taught him Welsh, and the children see it on Sunday evening, which also taught him Welsh. So Sundays were a busy day for him. Compulsory attendance at the Anglican Church was something that the nonconformists did not agree with. An alternative movement arose called the British and Foreign School Society, and in 1845, a British school was built in Glanaravon Mould. The week before its opening, Mr Roberts, the schoolmaster at Pontewild, announced that all the children would in future be free to go to chapel with their parents on the Sabbath. However, when Glanaravon opened, over half of the children left the national school, and among them was Daniel Owen. The school continued to serve the town until the 1960s, Indeed, my wife and her mother both attended the same school nearly a hundred years after Daniel. It had six classrooms, each with a fireplace, and a house adjoining the schoolyard for the headmaster. Daniel was nine years old when the British school opened in Mould. That school, unlike the national school, didn't focus on ecclesiastical coercion, but on academic work. Daniel remained a scholar at Glanaravon for almost four years and was remembered by his teachers and fellow pupils as an intense and likeable boy who showed no special talents. On his 13th birthday, Sarah persuaded Angel Jones, the local tailor and elder of Bethesda Chapel, to take Daniel on as an apprentice tailor. From then on, his education came from some basics at Sunday school and his own efforts. Knowing how restricted his education had been shows how hard he worked at self-improvement to be able to publish his first poem at the age of 20 and become a competent English translator three years later. However, although he passed the entrance exams for Ballard College at the age of 28, the curriculum he had to cope with in his first year was intense. He had to study arithmetic, English and Welsh grammar, Latin and Greek grammar, history, Caesar's commentaries the his, and the history of philosophy. And at the end of the year was tested in a series of seven three hour examinations taken consecutively at the rate of two per day, which had to be answered in English. There were 18 students in his year group. The actual marks and a grade ranking was published. Daniel came 11th in the basic topics, so he was in the lower performing section of the results. He also had to take two examinations in two different topics of theology, one on the principles of Calvinism and the other on Paul's epistle to the Galatians. The exam paper on Calvinism contained 12 compulsory questions about Calvin's divine inspiration from scripture. Then there were two papers set on the epistle, and each contained 12 more compulsory questions. The exams were taken in three sittings of three hours each, from Monday afternoon on June the 5th to Tuesday evening. For the theological exams, the students were allowed to decide if they pre preferred to answer in English or Welsh. Daniel was one of four students who chose to answer in Welsh. In the principles of Calvinism, the maximum possible mark was 203, and the highest mark awarded was 179. Daniel scored 139, which is 68%, and came sixth in his year group. For the first paper on the Galatians, a perfect answer could achieve 224 marks. The maximum mark awarded was 187, and Daniel came ninth in this year group, with a mark of 131, which is 58%. From the second paper on Galatians, the maximum possible mark was 209. The best achieved was 264, and Daniel scored 193, which was 66%, and came ninth in his year group. Overall, Daniel scored 65% in the theology papers and came seventh in his year group. When the secular subjects were taken into account as well, he scored 847 out of a possible 1,392 marks, 
which was an average of 60%, and he came 10th in his year group. Had he stayed on and continued, he would have had to face studying arithmetic and algebra, the works of Euclid, Latin and Greek grammar and composition, the Aeneid of Virgil, Salhurst Catiline, Jugartha and Xenophon's Anabasis, and the history of philosophy, and take eight three-hour examinations in these subjects. Then awaiting him in the final year would be nine three-hour exams on the whole of algebra, plane geometry, Euclid to Book 21, Tacitus's histories, the Formio of Terence, the Georgics of Virgil, Plato's Republic, Aristotle's Nicotinian Ethics books 1 to 3, Latin and Greek composition, and the history of philosophy, as well as exams in theology. For a man with so little formal education, he acquitted himself well among a group largely consisting of far better educated young men. But as most of these subjects, apart from the theological topics, were new to him, it must have taken a considerable amount of work to achieve what he did. And at this time, Daniel was suffering a crisis in belief. He'd hoped that by taking up preaching and enrolling on a college course leading to ordination, this would encourage the Holy Spirit to visit him and confirm his membership of the elect. But as his sermons show, this didn't happen. So when his brother wrote to tell him that he was about to become an uncle, meaning that David would find supporting their mother and sister much more difficult, Daniel decided to leave the course. He didn't discuss his reasons with either the college principal, Lewis Edwards, or the Reverend Roger Edwards, who was one of his tutors. He simply returned to Mould just before Christmas and went straight to Angel Jones Jr.'s tailor's shop to ask for his old job back, which he got. He had decided to become the best possible tailor who preached in his spare time in the hope of a revelation rather than fail as an ordained minister who was yet but a listener. His published sermons show that Daniel certainly believed in God, but he was by no means convinced that God believed in him. For the next nine years, Daniel threw himself into building a tailoring business, managing the Estethfod, part-time preaching and breeding canaries, whilst earning enough to provide for his sister Leah and his mother Sarah. During this time, his old editor, Nathaniel Jones, had become a minister on the Gower Peninsula, and when he heard that Daniel had taken up preaching, he wasted no time in inviting his old friend down to his new chapel to let the congregation hear him. This is what Nathaniel told Isaac Foltz about Daniel's abilities as a preacher. I heard him speak once when he came to see me on the Gower, as I was able to offer him a night's work preaching. He took as his text the words of Cain, for my iniquity is more than can be forgiven. In terms of the sermon's method of construction, it was, as I would expect of him, unassuming and natural. It was as if he had never heard or seen anybody else ever preach before. And so he didn't try to copy anyone. In his delivery, he was quite himself. Many remember that his sermons showed the same mental attributes that later characterised his writings. In a simple and pleasing way, he observed the ways of the world. He was able to identify good and bad men and had the skill and courage to portray both one and the other. His text led him to explain the circumstances and their effects on the persons involved and was a peaceful and insightful retelling of incidents surrounding the event. I'm sure, after hearing him that evening, that the Welsh had a new preacher in him. But it wasn't to be. His sermon about Cain can be found in my translation of the seven sermons of Daniel Owen. So how did he come to discover he had a talent for writing which people engaged with and enjoyed? Well, this is how Daniel described what happened next. In March 1876, I burst a blood vessel in my lungs three times in a fortnight. No one thought that I would live, and I've since languished for many years. Dr. Edwards of Mould and Dr. J. Roberts of Chester looked after me extremely well during that period I was seriously ill. It was during my convalescence 
that I wrote down seven of my sermons for the treasury under the title Offerings from Solitude. Eliza Jones, a mole girl who was a slightly older contemporary of my nine, wrote a memoir in which she explained more about this blood vessel incident. And this is how she described it. On Sunday, after preaching in Tlagothlan, before returning on the Sunday morning, Daniel went to Casteth Dinas Bran, and while he was coming down the hillside, he put his foot in a ditch and fell on his back. He didn't consult his doctor, but he injured his lungs. By the end of the week, he was bleeding from the mouth. The hemorrhage of his lungs was very bad and recurred three times. He was extremely ill and no one thought he would live. Meetings, meetings were held to pray for his recovery and he got better, but he was never the same again. Daniel had suffered a fall which being left untreated resulted in a pulmonary embolism and possible broken ribs, which he ignored until their symptoms became life-threatening. That bout of illness destroyed his public confidence, as Elsa Jones also reports. She said that soon after his recovery, he went to the chapel to listen to a, proper, a popular preacher, but the crowd and excitement were too much for him and he had to come out. For years after this, he feared to go into the church and would listen to the service in a small room behind the pulpit, out of sight of the people. Eventually, he felt well enough to sit at the back of the chapel by the door. That bout of serious illness wiped out his confidence to preach and he became a social recluse, hiding in his tailor's shop, keeping company with the canaries he bred. His total loss of confidence made it impossible for him to carry out preaching engagements and he became afraid to go out in public. This had important consequences. The extensive time he spent in the company of his canaries led to an ongoing illness now known as bird fancier's lung which plagued him for the rest of his life. The Reverend Roger Edwards had taught Daniel at Bala College and while Daniel was recovering from his pulmonary embolism, Edwards encouraged him to revise and polish some of the sermons he had delivered in numerous chapels. The following year, as his health improved, Daniel selected seven sermons and prepared them for publication as a series of articles in a dressover, which Roger Edwards edited. They ran intermittently from January 1877 until December 1877. Later, Daniel would publish them in book form. The narrative trajectory of this series of sermons is clear. Daniel begins by noting that God is all pervasive in the world. He proclaims that God has an infinite capacity for mercy, but that religious believers should not lie to themselves or others about their relationship with God. He goes on to point out that God continually speaks to his followers but they do not always hear him, and he pushes this message home by pointing out that even Jesus' disciples did not recognise him when he appeared to them. He then suggests that some individuals might be equipped to answer God's call, but might not have enough self-belief to answer that call. He closes his series of reflections with the stinging insight that attending church, studying the Bible and joining the seat is not enough if you do not hear God speak to you. The last of these seven sermons that Daniel reworked during his convalescence is perhaps the most revealing of all. It deals with the faith of a Roman centurion who, whilst not a Jew, was blessed by Jesus for his outstanding faith. The final sentences of this sermon reveal a deep bitterness in Daniel, which I think stems from the lack of any sign from God that he was among the chosen. Let me read it to you. Visitors who come every summer from the extremities of England to climb to the top of Snowdon to see the magnificent views from her ridge are often amazed to learn that many who have spent their lives around her skirts have never climbed to her head. 
the familiarity of those born and bred around the foot of Snowdon has worn away the desirability of climbing her to see the sights. We, brought up at the foot of the mountain of God, are in danger of being deprived of the desire to climb to its head to see the king in his glory. It is a serious consideration that having been given the chance to listen to the gospel all our lives, and having heard so much about the Bible in Sunday school, we may finally still be thrown into the outer darkness. Yet many who were not granted such religious privileges, but by chance came into contact with the divine, will sit with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. When I first read this, I couldn't help feeling that although Daniel had a deep belief in God, he believed that his failure to receive a personal call meant that God did not believe in him. Following the logic of his Calvinistic belief, he concluded he might still be finally thrown into the outer darkness. All his life, Daniel had been forced to attend church, chapel, Sunday school and see it. Yet God had still not spoken directly to him. He might well have interpreted the sudden illness inflicted on him whilst he was striving to preach the word of God it was a clear sign that he was not one of the elect. So where could he go from there? I believe this is when he started to think about the nature of the people who taught him these beliefs, which were mentally torturing him. This is how he described his next step. I wrote a few sketches of characters for publication, and then a dressover had the sermons and sketches printed in a book. Whilst writing these sketches of Methodist characters, Daniel discovered a talent for perceptive observation. I can't help thinking there's quite a lot of Daniel lurking in the character of George Roderick, particularly when, with a heavy heart, the grumpy old man with his sour and sarcastic face went to his house to escape. In his sketches, Daniel draws on his personal experience of the sort of people he had met during his religious travails, and he looks at their public persona, their private motivations and their human weaknesses. The result is a most amusing insight into the religious life of the town of Mould in the 1870s. He develops an approach to truth by telling a story, which may well have helped him come to terms with his own religious disappointment. In doing so, however, he takes his initial steps to becoming Wales's first great novelist. He would later be encouraged to develop this style of observational character sketches in an extended form to create a serial for a dressover that would later be published as his first novel, A Drevlan, The Township. However, it is this initial series of fictional accounts of imaginary Methodist worthies which first reveal Daniel's talent for portraying truth about life through creative fiction writing. I hope my translation does justice to this early work of Daniel's, but just in case, I've also included the original Welsh text at the end of my book. On Monday evening, I attended the Daniel Owen Memorial Lecture given by Rebecca Roberts, which I greatly enjoyed. And might I also compliment the simultaneous translation as well, which was excellent. The lecture was held in the schoolroom of Bethesda Chapel, and before the lecture, I was allowed to view the chapel. It's over 60 years since I was last in there. That was when I attended the funeral of my great-uncle Teddy, and I'd forgotten the stark and sinful splendour of Capel Mower. I stood in the pulpit where Roger Edwards and John Owen preached. I sat in the big seat where Angel Jones presided, and I also stood with bowed head by the pew nearest the door, where Daniel fought down his demons of public humiliation, and I was truly awestruck. It was drawn to my attention that on the white walls of Capel Mower, there are none of the memorial tablets to departed worthies that clutter the walls of Anglican churches. The Calvinistic creed does not subscribe to such personal aggrandizement, with one exception. On the plain white wall near the pew where Daniel sought solace, there is a simple brass plaque. It's been lovingly polished and cherished over the years, and it bears the name Daniel Owen, novelist. And a simple inscription sums up his life. It says, Taylor, preacher, 
politician and devoted worshipper in the chapel here. It's perhaps the most elegant mark of respect that could be offered to his departed merit. And finally, I was offered the opportunity to play the magnificent organ. I selected the quietest preset of stops and I played Callan Lan very softly. And as I played the Amen, I offered a silent prayer to the Calvinistic God from whom Daniel feared rejection. That at the end, he'd seen fit to receive, soothe and cherish the anguished soul of Daniel Owen, a dolor in a chapel whom, to sit with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Jokobau. Thank you. My name is Robert Lomas. I'm a quantum physicist. My family has got four generations under the ground in mould, and I am a great fan of Daniel Owens. Thank you for listening.